Welcome to Being Human. This week, my guest is Michael Sahota. He's an agile, in quotes, agile culture and leadership trainer and consultant. Uh, he's also the author of several books, or at least a couple of books, and a multitude of blog posts, which have been a big inspiration for me over the years in my work in the, in the agile world. So, Michael, a, a warm welcome to the show. Thank you for having me here. It's, it's really an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's worth us just, just for those listeners who are completely new to the Agile conversation, and we do get some, uh, I think for you, given, given your history in this community, could you, could you give us a brief summary of, of what you think uh, Agile is at least today? All right, here it goes. So agile is both the doing and the being. It's both a, a set of practices or way of working as well as a mindset shift to a different way of functioning that has much higher levels of performance. And when we look even deeper what agile really is, it's about people over process. And we look even deeper of what is this mindset shift towards people over process, we come to an understanding that Agile is talking about evolving to a different culture system, changing from away from business as usual into something more like green or teal from Frederick Lelou's reinventing organization. So we can understand Agile both being about teams as well as being a, a shift in the whole organizational system towards a much more agile or high performance way of working. Okay. So it's about high performance and it's about teal. So there are going to some people thinking, what the blue blazes does he mean by that? Uh, so if we look at, you know, the job of any managers to increase the operational efficiency of an organizational system to help make it perform better. So ultimately, every individual wants to be successful. Every manager's job is to help their people and their teams being successful, uh, which is we can call that high performance, right? People are seeking higher levels of performance to survive in the complex, uh, adaptively, rapidly changing business world, to survive against competitive threats, to evolve products quicker, uh, have higher quality, and so on. Um, and in terms of Teal, Teal's pointing towards a, uh, like, I, I, the, I guess the news headline here is that business as usual equals low performance. That if your organization is operating in a way aligned with business as usual, the traditional way of operating, that's actually a very low performance way. There's clearly understood models or, or teal uh, that have uh, emerged all over the world from different companies in different industries. They've all co-evolved the same similar set of patterns that high performance is actually radically different from business as usual. And it's fully accessible to all of us so that high performance is there if we want it. It requires some awareness, some choice, some desire and focus to get there but and that's what agile's point about so you know agile if we look at the deepest sense is actually inviting us to start moving towards higher performance ways of working and, and functioning and being okay uh, so what okay so let's say that um somebody's listening to this and they're saying okay i like the sound of this i like the sound of high performance i like the sound of teal what's my what's my access point into this and you've talked about it in terms of of being and doing you know where where do i start or or maybe where did you start? I don't know. How, how do people start with this conversation? <laughs> so well, let, let's look at this. A lot of people are interested in transformation. They want to transform the organization from the way it is now to a higher performance state, whether through agile transformation or some other transformation program. Right? Yeah. Okay. So we all know that culture is strategy for breakfast, yes? So if culture eats strategy for breakfast, strategy eats tactics for afternoon tea, that's, that's my quote. Uh, it's my little addition. It's a famous Drucker statement that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Strategy eats tactics for afternoon tea. So starting with tactics to create high performance is absurd. And yet this is where a lot of transformation programs begin. Uh, and when we start with tactics, we end with tactics and nothing of any consequence really happens. So, okay, well, let's say we move up to strategy. We have a strategic plan. 
there's no strategic plan that will allow you to transform your organizational system. People call them transformation programs, but they're not really transformation. Transformation is a fundamental shift in what's happening. Well, how do we create that? Well, it actually talks about a culture shift. And then when we have that understanding, it's like, oh, well, in order to create the high performance outcome I want to create the real success I want to survive in the current competitive world, I actually need to upgrade or evolve my organizational culture or dare I transform my organizational culture. Right. Okay. So, so it's about starting with, with culture. I can, I can see that. And it's not about the strategic plan. And that's certainly been my experience of helping, helping clients uh, transform. Where do, where do people start? This is their sort of age old question. Where do I start? Do I start with me or do I start with my environment? Oh, that's a great question. You know, the answer is that we need to do both and they're actually the same. They're actually the same. When, like, if we look at it, oftentimes we look at the environment, we want to change other people's behavior. We say, oh, this person's not doing that. We want to coach them. We want to mentor them. We want to ask a powerful question to unlock them. You know, there's a lot of this going on the agile phase of coaching and, you know, all this sort of behavior, but helping fix the other, helping fix the environment. Now, if we look at it, the deepest truth of reality of being human, we can't change anyone else. We can only change ourselves. That's the deepest level of understanding what it means to be human. And from that place, we know how it feels when we see, when we think about a leader who inspires us, we think of a leader who inspires us, is because they walk the talk. They don't ask us to do anything they're not doing themselves. When we think of leaders who we don't look up to, who we perhaps even disrespect or dislike, is because they say one thing, and they do another thing. And we don't know where we stand with them. Or we know where we stand with them and it's not very good. So we know from our experience of others that we are inspired by leaders who walk the talk. So at some level, the, or you know, 10 times the impact we can have on anyone else is by showing up the way we want to and, and being really honest about how we're showing up and working through how we're showing up. That's actually the most powerful way to permanently shift an organizational system. Right. So it does sound like you, there is a primacy there as far as you're concerned, and it, and it is with self. Well, so it, it is and it isn't because when we shift how we're showing up, it immediately impacts the system we're in. So there is no separation. Everything we're seeing in the external system is ultimately a reflection of what we're doing ourselves. You know, the biggest common, you know, the biggest thing we explore is when when people are getting resistance, is they're doing, if you're getting resistance, folks, uh, it, you're doing something to be involved with that resistance, perhaps even creating it. So, like, so there is no, I, I mean, yeah, it starts with yourself. You can say that in a way. And when, when we start with ourselves, we immediately impact the world around us. So it's not that we're separate. I mean, this notion that we're separate from everything else around us is, is, is I think, maybe even part of the challenge. Right. So there was a flaw in my question, even. <laughs> well, no, it's a good question. It's just like there's a, no, it's a good question. It's just that they're interrelated. Like it, it, there's no, uh, no, it's a, it's a good question because I didn't have, I certainly didn't have the awareness before you asked the question. Right. And, and the first order answer is you do start with yourself. And the second order understanding, the deeper understanding is that, well, it's, it's just connected. So right. working on yourself is working on the environment. That's the, I think that's the thing. Is if you think, oh, I just need to work on myself. I just need to do this. No, 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 no. When you work on yourself, you are working on the environment. Because how you're showing up is going to influence everything around you. It's just an indirect mean. We think that the most effective way is to work directly on the environment. When the most effective means actually work indirectly on the environment through our own behavior. It's just we don't understand you know, what is actually true effectiveness. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, and I love that answer. And, and, and I, th I, th I suppose it's in stark contrast to perhaps what some people view or the characterization of agile, which is, oh, well, I've got to organize myself into these two week time boxes, or maybe I need this role called this scrum master, whatever that means. And, and, and you, so the, on, on the surface level, it, it seems a little esoteric and, and nothing at all to do with what you've just described, which is, I need to start working on myself. 
and seeing how that shows up in my environment and then work on that in, in some form of iteration. So I, I think that's fascinating. That, that and, and certainly that's been my experience, but it, it's fascinating that that's, that's really at the core of, of this conversation, this agile conversation. It, yeah, it, it absolutely is. I mean, let's just look at it. Imagine you have a bunch of people working in a certain way of working and being. They have a certain set of behaviors. And you want to have a high, higher performing organizational system. Well, are the behaviors going to be the same or different in the, the higher performing organizational system? Right, they're different. They're going to be different. Okay, well, what has to happen for people to change? Who has to change their behavior? One person, two people, all the people. Who has to change their behaviors? Each individual at some level, right? E each individual has to change their behaviors, right? So unless the individual changes their behavior, there is no transformation. Organizational transformation is a reflection of personal transformation. So how can we even begin to think about a transformation, a shift in culture, unless we're actually looking about people actually changing their behaviors and how they're showing up, how they're shifting their mindset? It doesn't make any sense. But that's called, you know, agile transformation by definition doesn't make sense and has a, almost 100% failure rate to fail the actual objectives it's trying to achieve. So, right, so like... I, <laughs> yeah, you quoted a percent right in your run. In your Agile Adoption and Transformation Survival Guide, guide yeah. 80%. What did I say there? I, I don't remember. 84% like failure seven. rate, right? Yeah, I, I, I'd say, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll upgrade it. I, I'd say it's probably about 100% failure rate at this point. Right. I, I, would, I would agree that it's, it's <laughs> close to that. It must be close to that. So if, it's, if, it's, uh, if it starts with, with my, myself, is there a, a particular orientation to the work that I do on myself when I'm seeking to uh, be at the cause of a, a transformation of the organization I'm in towards higher performance in this new context we find ourselves? Or are there some pointers? Is there is a directionality to this self-development? Yeah, so, so let's imagine people on this call are listening and they're saying, ah, well, I'd like to... Uh, you know, be the change. Take Mahatma Gandhi's line, be the change you want to see in the world. It's not a uh, abstract notion of an ideal. It's actually very practical advice is to really honestly look at the world state that you wish to manifest or create this higher performance world state where people behave in different ways and simply do the delta on your behavior. There's a technology most people have in their homes, even in their offices, called a mirror. The mirror is used to look at ourselves. Uh, I, I'm speaking metaphorically here, of course. But when we use to look at ourselves and see really truthfully, how am I showing up right now? And what is it I desire to have as an end state for this organizationalism? How do people need to show up there? And am I actually behaving the way that I espouse that I want to create in the world? It's a very simple question. Uh, and it takes courage to look at the truth. Uh, I would say some very high percentage. I won't, I won't give the number. Uh, very, very high number. A very high percentage of people who say they're agile coaches or scrum masters purporting to move and help people with this thing called agile do not actually live the agile mindset themselves. They may talk about the agile mindset, they may even run many trainings or sessions on the Agile mindset, but in their own personal behavior, they don't actually live the Agile mindset in their own personal behavior. So, um, and we all know what, it, what you call it when someone says do this, but they don't do it themselves. Yeah. Right. So what do I mean by this? I'll tell you my story. So my story is like, I, I woke up one moment and I go, oh my gosh, I teach collaboration and I suck at collaboration. I'm a horrible team member. And I looked at the truth of that. And I saw the places where I, I want to be the smartest guy in the room, where I wanted to have my idea win, where fill, you know continue to fill in the blanks here. I wasn't really to celebrate the excellence of others and make other people in the team look amazing and high five them on. I looked at all those places. And I saw I'm not showing up the way I want to show up and then I worked on it. 
But the starting place is, is looking at the truth, the reality. And without, I mean, what, you needed to, what do you need for growth? You need to be able to have a desire for something better and a willingness to look at the truth of where you are. And once there's that, that gap, that tension, then, then something can move forward. But until those preconditions are there, it's someone else's problem, it's the environment, it's that manager's not on board, it's blah, 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 fill in the blank of, you know, the team's not showing up, blah, 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 like it's all the rest of it. Right. So, so your Damascian moment was, was okay, I suck at collaboration. But, but is the, was that like... Is, oh, no, is no, this was a later one. No, there, there I was, was going to so say... More, <laughs> there, there were so many epiphanies before that. That was just one of many, many on the journey. Right. But it was, so what, what was the first time in which, you, yeah, okay, so when did you first so make I, that I, flip? So I, and th- okay, I, I need to start looking at myself and, and working on myself. Yeah, be- so uh, that's a great question. I, I think, you know what, I, I actually heard this somewhere that ultimately all high performance leadership programs have one common element, which is self awareness. I heard this like last week. And I, I don't know if that's true or not. It sounds good though. It's certainly aligned with what I believe <laughs> or my understanding of the laws of, of human change in organizational physics. Uh, and if we look at when, like, it's not a, it's not a once, like a, there's not, it's like a, it's like a journey. Like people look at like, like Michael, how, how is it that you uh, travel around the world with the woman you love, who's works with you to run your business and co-trains with you and teach executives and managers all over the world and help organizations become high performance with this, this, you know, this very uh, niche boutique consulting. And now you're growing a a group of elite consultants all over the world to support organizations on their journeys. Like how how do you, like, what was the moment where it's like, no, no, there is no moment. There is no moment. It's, it's like a flywheel. And this is, if you look at the book, good to great, they, they talk about this. It's pushing on the same thing day after day after day, week after week after week, year after year after year, when we have a, um, an ongoing determined pursuit of excellence, of anything we want in our life, we will succeed. There's no one, this is the moment. Like it's, it's an ongoing. It's like it's the sustained investment and effort yields fruit. Like success is hard work. There's no... You know, that's my understanding, at least. Yeah, no, I, I get it. And maybe there is no, there's no one moment. It's just when I think to my own history, you know, I can, I can, I can remember particular yeah. moments where I, I decided, okay, this, that some, I need to start looking at, at myself, right? And I just, uh, I suppose that was the driver for the question, but. Um, yeah, no, no, actually, you know, there's, there is an answer that comes close to that, which is, uh, this is actually, this is actually a good story. Uh, <laughs> which is the probably if there was one which is uh, uh i don't know there's so many but I'll, I'll tell you a good story at least it'll, it'll line up with the question and it's a good story so i remember i was uh working with agile in organizations i i've been in a manager and executive i knew agile from being on a teams and so on so i knew all about agile from the inside of an organization and i was working externally as a coach consultant trainer and i my desire my passion is about build building high performance helping whatever group I was working with, create high performance. And what I noticed that no matter, the limit was always with the leader, how much they understood the agile mindset, how much they were transformed in their own inner world, whether I was dealing with a, a manager, a director, a CIO, CEO, didn't matter who I was dealing with. The level of consciousness or level of mindset within them was the limit for how far I could actually help them with agile. And then I looked, well, I said, well, to create the success that I want, for me to create the success I want of creating high performance environments where people are engaged, motivated, there's incredible products, and yet to create the success that I want, it is required that I help these leaders grow. And then I looked at myself in the mirror. And I remember I used that technology earlier, the mirror. Uh, I looked at myself in the mirror. And I said, well, Michael, are you equipped to help these leaders grow, to evolve their consciousness, their mindset? to show up as leaders who can hold an agile environment. And the answer I got back was, well, no, Michael. Uh, No, Michael, you you are a well-intentioned asshole. There is no possible way you can help these leaders grow because you're not even showing up this way yourself. Like, how could you possibly do this? And then I had a choice. I could either grow 
or I could give up on my dream of creating high performance organization. And the reason we're having this conversation now, the reason I do the work that I do now is because I chose to grow. I chose to work through my leadership edges, evolve myself to a place where I could inspire leaders. I mean, at that point in time, I had this hypothesis that if, if I change how I show up, could I actually inspire leaders to take their, their journey to grow themselves? That was my hypothesis. So I proved it myself. I've now proved it that I actually have a repeatable structure of how to undertake this, that I train people all over the world, managers, coaches, scrum masters, et cetera. And now I know from people who reported this all over the world, they've taken what I've shared and they've replicated it in their own world that by changing how they show up, they can invite other people to change how they show up. Which of course, to come back to your question about transformation, starting with the individual, is the secret of lasting sustainable transformation of a fundamental shift in the uh, operating characteristics of an organization. All right. And is, is the key to this, your emotional, the, the freedom system that you describe in emotional science? Or? No, no, no. That's, it, it, so, so yeah. So like, it, well, let, let me describe that first and then I'll, then I'll comment on that question. So, uh, so I co-wrote a book uh, on uh, called emotional science which is, it's called the science part. Uh, it turns out if you think about science, how can science explain something like emotions? It's, it's absurd to think science can explain how our emotions work from a, you know, this is exactly what it is and blah, blah, blah. However, it, what we do with the book is we take people on an experiential journey so they discover for themselves how their own emotions work. That's the science part, it's the experimental science aspect of science. And what happens as people go through this and discover is that Emotions are not what they thought they were. And that um, reading the book can actually be a, a life-changing experience. And we've had many, many such reports. Because what happens is as a leader, as somebody who wants to influence others, if I'm not aware of my own internal state, how can I say that I'm showing up the way I want to? If my emotional state is destructive, if I'm in irritation, frustration, annoyance, right? If that's going on for me throughout the day, Am I, is that part of high performance? Is that how I want to show up as a leader? Is that part of my future state that I want to create? Probably not. Probably most high performance states don't have people who walk around irritated, frustrated. I mean, most of us were frustrated about emails, we're in meetings, people like there's this annoying stuff going on. It, it takes us out. And if we're not resourced, if we're allowing the environment to take us out, how can we show up as the leader we want to do? How can we inspire people? How, we're not even showing up the way we want to. So that's emotional science in a nutshell. So it's a critical piece for anybody who wants to uh, create anything of what they want in their life, really to understand their emotional system and, and how to navigate and how to hack it both emotionally and intellectually. But is, is that the whole thing? No, that's just a small part. There's just a small part of the overall uh, tapestry of uh, I'd say intellectual property that uh, has been created over the last several years on this quest to how do we shift culture? How do we create high performance organizations? How do we help leaders evolve to a place? And how do we create something that will work regardless of industry, regardless of where the company is on their journey, regardless of, of size? And so that, that's where we are, where we've uh, evolved and created like an extraordinary approach technology for uh, organizational change permanent lasting shifts in, in culture and organizational evolution. Right. So a little reductive suggests that it's just about emotional freedom system. Um, but that's a part of it. So part of it is becoming more aware of my emotional state and, and developing ways to deal with that. Are there some other venues? Are there other, are there other key themes to, to, to this, uh, this approach of, of, of self-development as a leader? So, yeah, so uh, I've, got a, I've got a blog post in this where I go through this. Uh, it's not the full tease, of course, but of the, the 4 A's conscious leadership model, uh, which, you know, the simple summary is just stand in the truth, which is pointing to that mirror technology we talked about earlier, that we look at the truth of how we're showing up, we'll grow. And what this model actually does is it provides a very rapid way to create behavior shift. It's a very powerful uh, mechanism for creating the behavior, the habit shifts that we need, right? Because we look at culture as the aggregate of all of our behaviors. 
it, you know, if we have to change our behaviors to have a different culture, to have a different level of performance, well, then how do we actually change our behaviors? How do we do that? And I think the biggest trap the whole agile community has certainly fallen into is this uh, notion that, oh, we just change our structures and then the system will change. And uh, there is some small element of truth in that. But it, you know, when we change structures, when structures are changed, there's something else that usually accompanies, which is actually the thing that matters, which is leaders actually changing their behavior, which is people actually going through a behavior shift, which and before they do that, they have to choose to do it. So ultimately, um, what's required is, is a, a willingness and a, a choice around shifting behavior and an actual ability to shift behaviors that have often been there since early childhood and that we may not even be conscious of that are actually creating the destruction around us that are preventing us from showing up as the leader that we want to be. Hmm. And what, so, so you mentioned a few in this interview already, but what have been the, the toughest behaviors for you to shift personally? And what did you employ uh, to, to cause that shift in yourself? Yeah, so this 4 A's conscious leadership model is what I use daily, like many, many times a day. Just noticing, oh, I'm aware that I'm doing, so I'll go through, the 4 A's are very simple, awareness, acceptance, aspiration, ask for help. Um, so it's this daily awareness of how am I showing up right now? Like if you think about it from an agile perspective of like in a retrospective, we get together a team, we look at what's been happening over the last two weeks. If you look at what self-awareness is, what does it mean? It means at every moment of time, being aware of exactly how I'm showing up, how am I functioning, how am I responding to my environment? Am I connected with the people around me? Am I really listening? Am I responding in a resourceful way? Am I aware of how I'm showing up right now? What's my level of self-awareness? And when we start, we start evolving that as a, a foundational structure as a leader, what happens is we start detecting all these deltas. Oh, I'm aware that I show up this way. And acceptance is, oh, yeah, I see that I do that. I have this habit. I interrupt people. I judge people. You know, I push too hard for a result. I mean, we can go through this whole list, right? And then, and then it's, well, aspirations. Well, I, I don't want to interrupt people. Like, wow, when I interrupt people, what happens? Well, it hurts my relationship with them, which ends up hurting whatever I want to create because I don't have a good relationship. I'm damaging my relationship. And, oh, my gosh, I'm trying to create something with them, and I don't even know what they're saying. I don't even have the information I need to make a good decision anymore because I just interrupted them. Like, I'm just shooting myself in the foot. It's like, well, but like, when did I decide to, that I wanted to be a human being that trust people? I didn't decide that. I'm a complex system. I just ended up this way. So I'm not responsible how I got here because, you know, I'm a complex system. I just ended up this way. But I do have a choice about what I want to do with my life. And I do know I don't want to interrupt people. I want to, like, actually listen to what they have to say to have a healthy relationship with them and to, you know, learn information. Okay. So becoming aware, holding an aspiration, a commitment to a way of being is what I'm hearing. Yeah. You. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and, but the, the hard part is the acceptance, right? The hard part is the acceptance. The acceptance is saying, you know, I mean, look, as human beings, we're, we're designed psychologically, what, to seek pain or avoid pain? Well, ultimately, to avoid <laughs> yeah avoid pain right so when we well when we, uh, yeah you know, i would nuance that because i i think there is this phenomenon right of um of of seeking to recreate suffering in our lives in a sort of unconscious attempt sure. to resolve some trauma in our past so i think we are both pain avoiding and sort of suffering seeking simultaneously somehow Yes, 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 yes. So, so globally, we create our own pain. Let's, let's assume that's true. Let's just leave that aside for a moment. Whether it is or not is, is an interesting discussion. I, I, it is almost a matter of personal choice. And I, I believe that we, that's actually true based on a lot of the science and my understanding of human beings and so on. But that's, that's kind of a, a mood point. Let's assume, though, we're in some situation where we're, we have some unconscious behavior that's causing damage, right? Uh, it's, I call this a leadership edge, right? We all want to show up as leaders but we always like, there's a limit to how far we can show up to towards our ideal. Like we get blocked by some conditioning, some behavior and so on. So when we discover this, right, that we're not showing up as leader we want to be like, and we, you know, what do we do? Do we look at the truth of how we're causing damage to ourselves and others or do we avoid it? Like what, what, 
what, what do human beings do? Do they seek the pain or do they avoid the pain in the moment? In, in, that, in, the, in, in, in the scenario you described, absolutely. Yeah, we avoid it. Yeah, we avoid it, right? Well, so what happens all our lives when we avoid the pain, avoid the pain, avoid the pain? Is there any growth? <laughs> no. no we, <laughs> we, done, done, we, done. We, we put strategy on top of strategy on top of strategy, right? Yeah, yeah. We just, we just make things worse, right? Yeah, we don't actually resolve the actual problem. That's how we're designed as human beings to never actually resolve the problem. The, the path of, a, of somebody who chooses to grow themselves, to be the change they want to see, to evolve their leadership, has an understanding. It's a very simple understanding. Uh, you may have heard of this phrase, no pain, no gain. No pain, no gain. That when we willingly choose to go into the pain, into the difficulty, it's uncomfortable. It's psychologically uncomfortable. We're not going to die from it, but it's psychologically uncomfortable. However, we get the long-term benefit for the rest of our life. It's extraordinary. I mean, the, the ROI is phenomenal on, on looking at the damage we cause from our leadership edges. The ROI is incredible in our personal lives and our professional lives. However, so we need to have some sort of choice and awareness as a human being that this is going on, that our unconscious mind will, by default, take us away from the pain through minimization, justification, blame, anger, all these other things to keep prevent us from actually look at what we're doing. That's what you say. Look, just look at the truth. Stand in the truth of what you're doing and you'll grow. The, the, the unconscious mind will automatically sort itself out. Once we start seeing the damage of what we're causing, we actually choose to look into it. And this is why the acceptance part is tough because it's not, it's like 100% acceptance and actually looking at the damage we're causing to others and to ourselves through this behavior. Like human beings, we're extremely destructive towards ourselves and others. Uh, however, we don't, we don't recognize that because we don't look at it. And this is, the, this is the difference between somebody who wants to be a leader and someone who, who wants to keep on doing the same old, same old. People who choose to be leaders are ready to look at the truth of how they're showing up. Yeah, and I, and I think that's interesting. I think that's a, it, in, an exquisite description of what it means to be a leader because uh, with, a, with a richness and a depth that I d you don't often hear because we tend to think of the leader as the, as the guy or the girl who's got to the top of the tree. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, and, I'm and, about two-thirds people, away Sorry. Go ahead. No, go I ahead. Was say, and, and many of us, are, or there are some of us who are equipped to the get to the top of certain trees without ever doing this work, right? For whatever yeah. reason, they are equipped in a certain way to get to that destination without ever looking inside. And they're celebrated yes. by culture often. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, like, I don't have any judgment for the systems the way they are. When we have judgment towards the system, it's very difficult for us to work effectively with them. What I, I do have is just like, oh, well, this is a complex system. It got this way because it did. You know, people are in this situation because they are. My, my question is really about what do people want for themselves? Anyone, a team member, a scrum master, an agile coach, a manager, an executive, a board member. What do they want for themselves? What do they want to create in the world? Sorry, there's a bit of lag there. I'm not sure if there's yeah, a Yeah, there's a bit of lag there. That's right. What do they want for themselves? And, but I think there's something, almost, there's, I think that's absolutely right. And it's about, but there's also this, and what's your shadow? I think the other, the, other, the other side of what we're talking about here in terms of this excavation of truth is, and, and what's, what's the reality of your impact, right? In its totality. Mm -hmm. So you can want something yes. in the world and you can go at it and you can often achieve it, leaving a trail of destruction or doing it in yes. a way that's not sustainable. And I think what you're talking yes. to is, is, is ask that question, but also ask you, and what's, and what's going on in your pursuit? Well, for some people, Scorch Trail may be part of what they want to create. I don't know. It depends on what their ambition and desire is. If their desire is high performance, I don't think Scorch Trail is anywhere near, has any relationship with it. If it's about Agile, I don't think Agile has anything to do with Scorch Trails. Yeah. Right? So you talk about the shadow. The 40s is nothing other than looking in our shadow. 
It's a powerful tool to shine a light of awareness to cause a behavioral shift, a, a rewiring of the brain state, which is what behavioral change is about, which is what culture shift is about, which is what transformation is about. Without actually getting to the point of shifting behavior, shifting mindset, everything we're speaking of with transformation is a complete waste of time. Well-intentioned often, but generally, in my opinion, a complete waste of time. And maybe I'm speaking with a little bit of early, maybe it's only like 90% waste of time, but you know. Please allow me some poetic license. Well, Sometimes right. I get, get, get crazy and excited, you know. But <laughs> well, my experience of failed transformation is quite often you fail, you fail in, in your aims, but you've, you sometimes find you've sowed a few seeds that may yes. uh, you, you yes, create I, a bit I, of I, latent I, potential for the next effort. Right. Well, I call this in, inadvertent success. Despite the best efforts of the program that was very poorly designed, something good actually came of it. Not by the design, but by accidentally, serendipitously. Where people go like, oh, finally we can do what we make sense for us as a company. And they get to do this in little pockets. That's that's agile transformation as usual. Inadvertently, despite itself, it ends up having some success. Not the success that people hope for or intend, or the organization's survivability people's really desire, but little pockets of growth. Right, you're right. Right, exactly. Um, and, and I'm also minded to think of the, the sort of Dave Snowden critique of having transformation framed as a set of goals in the first place with, with set outcomes. Like from a complexity perspective, is, is that whole approach flawed at some level? Sorry, I, I, I missed that. I heard the Dave Snowden so, approach. Of- yeah, the, the Dave Snowden critique of, 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 of setting up a, a transformation in terms of goals and outcomes he might say is, is, is flawed from the outset when we're dealing with a, with a complex problem. Uh, I, I would agree with that. And I'd even go so far as to say using the word transformation is also part of the failure recipe. Say more. Uh, okay. So this is, this is another good one. Um, <clears throat> So imagine we want to achieve something which in hindsight is a transformational change in the organization. Imagine that we want to have a, a watermark shift. That's our desire is to have like a evolve organization to a place where it's functioning very, very differently. Let's imagine that's our desire for a moment. Yes. Yes. I'm with you. Okay. So what happens to people when you tell them there's, there's a transformation program, what happens to them psychologically? Many things, but fear is common. Fear is common. Okay. What happens when a human being's in a state of fear? What happens to the blood flow to their brain? The frontal cortex. Right. Less than the frontal cortex. It shuts off. Brain stem, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. More into fight or flight. Yeah. So we say transformation. I'm going to explain the math. You say we're going through a transformation, agile or otherwise. People go into fear. The blood flow to their frontal cortex shuts off or gets severely reduced, and they're no longer able to think. People no longer being able to think is the opposite, I think, of moving towards high performance. Because I usually associate high performance with people being able to think much better. And having blood, increased blood flow to their frontal cortex because they're feeling more safe and secure. That's just me. Call me crazy if you want. But like... Uh, I think, uh, you know, one of the key failure cause of agile transformation is, in fact, the word transformation. I get that. I get that. And I, I, I was... I, 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 go ahead. No, I was just thinking of the uh-huh. lean system, the lean approach, right? If you go back to Toyota production system, there's never any sense that this is about... Uh, you know, transforming in some grand sense with restructuring and and people losing, you know, and 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 getting leaner in that sort of less head sense. It's all founded on respect for people and learning and growing over time, right? Uh, yes and no. Let's just take what you said. If there's a reduction count associated with any transformation program, people will go into fear, and no improvement will happen, pretty much, or unless it happens accidentally in small pockets. Right, because they're going to be in fear for their jobs and so on, so on, so on. So that would be uh, a relatively unintelligent approach. We call it that. 
But going back to Toyota production system, I'll, I'll finesse your answer a bit. I'll extend it a little bit, which is there are two different uh, change approaches. There's Kaizen and there's Kaikaku. Kaizen is the incremental change. Everyone's part of the change and they evolve it themselves and so on, which is wonderful. And then uh, Kaikaku is um, where you make a, a significant shift. So if you need to get your factory from one state to another state, there might be some, some radical overhaul that you do to the system. Right, so so there's actually within uh, the Toyota way, there's actually two different mechanisms uh, that they understand and they use to evolve their 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 system that they found effective. Now, that's fine, that's wonderful, but if we look at what's going on and we look at the bigger picture we're speaking of, which is cultural evolution, we can quite, you know, from my perspective, it's very obvious that only one of those two approaches will actually work. That only the Kaizen approach, only an incremental evolutionary approach will actually work. That I think there's been this desire through holacracy and other types of approaches of radical overhaul of uh, Kaikaku, of having a fundamental shift. I mean, Scrum's an example, disastrous example of this fundamental shift. Oh, we'll just, you know, itself, uh, that's a whole other topic, right? But let's just stay with culture uh, of radical change uh, doesn't really work for, for permanent lasting shifts. I didn't even know that. I, I, I'm, I now have a new term. Yeah. So, I think it's fine to do kaikaku for tactical things, strategic things, but for cultural things, it, it doesn't doesn't make sense because culture means it's ultimately it's about an evolution of people's behavior. And to my knowledge, the technology has not been invented where you can walk a person into a room, give them a mindset shift, and have them walk out the other door. We're working on it. Uh, we have some prototype models of the technology, but um, but it's not it's not fully uh, uh, online yet. Are you, you serious? Uh, I'm serious. My, my, my wife, Audrey, is 20 years background in personal growth and transformation and worked on a medical team as an energetic healer for over five years and has completely proven, uh, you know, scientifically researched case studies of through energetic energy work uh, treating stage four cancer. So if we look at neurobiological shifts in the brain, whether it's treating stage four cancer or uh, creating a, a shift in behaviors, it, it, at at a, some level, it's just a shift in, in the energetic structure, uh, neuroplastic uh, structure of our, of our being and our physiology. And, and there's proven science, scientific proof of things that go beyond, you know, business as usual, go beyond, you know, 3D Newtonian mechanics. So, so, so yes, she's actually uh, created some prototypes of, of this technology. And, you know, so but we're not there yet. Right now, we're, we're, we're doing things the old-fashioned way with, through regular trainings and so on of creating experiences for people to create a rapid mindset shift. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that would blow my and we, mind. We do, it's funny. I, like a lot of people... <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Well, if I think I've, I've dedicated perhaps 20 years, I suppose you could say, at one level to mindset shift, to evolving my own behaviors and the way I view the world and my emotional reactions to situations and all of that. And, just the thought of being able to, to do anything like what I've done in the last two decades in a walk a year out of a room and out of it is on the one hand, on the one hand entirely exhilarating and another, I'm completely incredulous of that claim. Yeah, totally understand. Um, so, so like, you, you know, we have this, you know, two day agile culture and leadership training or certified agile leadership training and people walk out of it. And someone says, hey, what happened? And they go, uh, uh, and they try to describe it, but they can't quite describe it. Or they try to put some word. And because what happens is we're giving people in that experience, it structures a regular two-day business training. People are sitting at tables and blah, blah, blah. And, but we give people an experiential environment that challenges their uh, identity, values, beliefs perceptions, model, world, worldview, to the extent where they walk out of the room with a shift in their perceptions, their behaviors, and they, 
they start interacting with the world differently. It's not the, 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 techno, the future technology that we, you know, that we have prototypes of, uh, but it, it, it is something extraordinary. And a lot of people in the Agile community talk about mindset shift. We actually have the, the technology to do it. Both my wife and I have studied consciousness in India. There are uh, things that we have access to uh, that go beyond this traditional business Western frame that we are able to use to give people the, the success that they're looking for to get the, the results that, that they hope for. Right. Okay. <laughs> we can't find and it, it is too good to be true, right? Like, it, like look, look, if, it, it, look, if somebody came up to me and said, you know, um, you know, hey, hey, Richard, you know, we, you know, the, 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 like, the, the whole pursuit of, you know, the, the golden dream uh, is that we can understand what organizational culture is and create permanent lasting shifts in it in a permanent, reliable, repeatable way with a step-by-step -step of how to do it. You'd be like, wow, that's the holy grail of business. What, you, you've cracked the code on that? I, I'm not going to make that claim. I do know that people come to our class, say it was the best training they ever had. I do know people who come say, this is five years ahead of the curve. Not one person, but repeatable. People come in and say it's enlightening. Not one person, many people. Like, I, I got hundreds of testimonials from people all around the world that have had extraordinary experience, experiences. And not only that, when we hear the, the stories of people, we have a monthly call for our people and stuff like that, of how they're applying this and the success they're creating, because they're starting with themselves. This is coming time back to the beginning of our conversation because they're looking at how they're showing up. And instead of asking anyone or blaming anyone about what they're doing, they're looking in the mirror at how they're showing up and what they need to change. And when they do that, they unlock the systems around them. Hmm. Like I, you know, I spent most of my life as a skeptic, like, uh, like, I, like what, what happened? How do we get here? Well, I, I was looking at, you know, figure out to make agile work. We need to shift the culture organization. I go, well, how do you shift culture? I read all these books, watched all these videos, learned from other people, went to conferences, went to trainings. And I go like, geez, nobody has an answer here. And I go, but a lot of people have little pieces of an answer. And so I've put all the little pieces together and now there's a, we have this, you know, very clear picture of, oh, this is what it takes. This is how to do it. You know, when we talked about some of the key pieces, start with yourself. Look at how you're showing up. You know, are you showing up in a way that you want to create the environment? It's, it's that simple. If you want a teal organization, if you want a high performance organization, show up as a high performance leader. Right. Yeah. Getting there is the uh, well. The, the injunction is simple. The, the 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 means and the and the I suppose the, the journey to get there. It's not even that hard. We actually we just talked about the two key pieces. Look at yourself in the mirror. Use the four A's to look at how you're showing up and how you aspire to be, and look at your emotional state. Those two unlock an incredible amount of performance. Those two alone. That's oh, no, part I mean, of it's part of my daily practice. It's part of everyone who works at our company, part of the daily practice. Because when you do that, there are no more arguments. There's no more conflict. Instead, there's just listening to each other and listening to places we internally where we're stuck. It's incredible. It's, it's such, a, such a level up on performance. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the process is... is is in a sense straightforward. I would, do, I, from what you're describing, if it's if it's anything like if it if it's similar to, I suppose, my experience. It, I like the expression. It, you know, it's it's easy to do this. Uh, you just have to do what's hard. Right? Yes. Yeah. You just have to do the hard work of looking at the truth of how you show up. You know, and um, that's because uh, we have this little part of our voice, rah, 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 and it doesn't serve us. Okay, I know we've only got two minutes left, Michael, uh, and and you, you're going to another call. So I am immensely grateful for your grateful for your for your time, for your energy, for where you've taken me in this conversation. And I I hope it. And I, you you gave me with a hook right at the end there, and I wish we had more time to explore <laughs> consciousness. I wish we had more time what you've learned about consciousness in your travels of India, maybe that'll have to save for another conversation.
Yeah, though, though this is, uh, I, I really appreciate this conversation. I really appreciate your questions. Uh, it's very clear to me that you've done a lot of work, that you have deep insights into this topic in this area. And we're dealing with a very complex problem, a very sophisticated complex problem. And uh, I really enjoyed this time because I've learned things, I've gotten additional clarity. I, I love these kind of interviews because I, there are parts that I know and there are parts that your questions are so good they unlock a deeper awareness in myself. So I, I'm really uh, appreciative and grateful of this time. Thank you so much for inviting me here. No, thank you. And the best place for people, if they want to learn more about your work, wh where should they go? Uh, my website, Agilitrix. Or they can also just Google my name, Michael Sahoda. And I thoroughly recommend, uh, if you've ever got just a, a question in this whole Agile conversation. If you if you if you Google Michael's name with that topic, there's a there's a better than even odds that you're going to get a a very good and well written blog post with an excellent uh, infographic or your 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 doodles, your pictures alongside it. So, yes. Thanks once again. Well, my pleasure. My pleasure. Really delighted to be here. No, enjoy the rest of your of your day. Thank you.